crisis, cross holdings. Cross holdings are what I call the black hole of valuation. It's the thing I most detest in valuation, is valuing companies with lots of cross holdings. And here's why. The accounting for cross holdings is all over the place. At least in US accounting, there are three ways a cross holding can be accounted for. If you own a small piece of a company, 3%, 5%, and take absolutely no role in how that company is run, the holding can be classified as a minority passive investment. If you have a minority passive investment, here's what you have to show in your income statement, the dividends you receive from those cross holdings, and here's what you have to show in your balance sheet, what you originally invested to get that cross holding. Think about it. If you invest in a young growth company 10 years ago, let's say 20 million, that young growth company is now worth a lot, $100 billion. In your income statement, I might see nothing because that company still doesn't pay a dividend. And in your balance sheet, I might see the $20 million you invested 10 years ago. That doesn't help me very much. That's minority of passive investments. Here's the second step up the ladder. Let's say you own 5, 10, 15% of a company, take some role in how the company's run. Then you have to use what's called the equity approach. What's the equity approach? In your income statement, you have to show 15, 20% of the net income or net loss of that company, but below the operating income line. And in your balance sheet, you have to update your original investment for the portion of retained earnings you've accumulated since. So in other words, it's like an updated book value. A little better than minority passive investment, but not quite there. And if you own 55, 60% of a company, you're required in most accounting standards to consolidate, which effectively means you've got to act like you own 100% of the company. All the way through, in your income statement, you have to show 100% of revenues and 100% of operating income. In the balance sheet, you have to record 100% of the subsidiary's assets. But here's how you show the fact that you don't own 40 or 45% of the company. The item that shows up is minority interest. It shows up on the liability side of the balance sheet. It reflects what the accountant thinks the 45% that doesn't belong to the subsidiary is worth. It's a book value. Now you see why it's so difficult to value cross holdings. First step is you've got to figure out how the accountants have dealt with these cross holdings. In a perfect world, here's how I'd value cross holdings. I'd value the parent company standing alone. And then I'd value each cross holding separately. I don't care whether you own 5%, 10%, or 65%. And I take the percentage of each subsidiary that belongs to you. The advantage of doing it is I can have different characteristics for each company. Different cost of capital, different growth rates, different risk profiles, which I think is appropriate. So in a perfect world, this is how I'd value companies. But in this world, I would need full financial statements for every subsidiary. And I have a parent company financial separated from the consolidated financial. In the world that we live in, that's often not the case. We're not given the information on subsidiaries to do this full-fledged valuation. We're given pieces and bits. And especially if the subsidiary is a private business, you might have very little to go on. So here are two options you might use to at least get an approximation. If you have a cross-holding in a publicly traded company, you can always cheat and use the market value of that holding. It's cheating because in intrinsic valuation, we are assuming the market make mis makes mistakes. But this might be your best choice if you have no other information. If your holding is in a private business and you have the book value of the holding, you can apply a price to book ratio. Based on what? Based on what publicly traded companies in that business trade at. So if I have a cross holding in a chemical company and it's a private company and a typical chemical company trades at one and a half times book value, I might multiply the book value by 1.5 to get my estimated value for the cross holding. I'm not happy with doing that. I'd rather do an intrinsic valuation, but without the information, this might be the best you can do. So you've dealt with cash, you've dealt with cross holdings. Third step in the process, look around. Are there any other assets you want to bring into the mix? And let me separate the assets you should try to bring in from the assets you should not. You don't want to double count assets. Any asset that is generating cash flows should not be counted. So if you have a factory, that has a physical value, a real estate value, you should not be adding the factory to the present value of the cash flows you get from operating the factory. If you have a headquarters building, you shouldn't be adding the value of the real estate, that, the real estate in that, that headquarters building to the value of your cash flows. That'd be double counting. So what you're looking for are truly unutilized assets that have value, but you haven't counted in your cash flows. Those are rare, but they can exist. You might even decide to count things like you know, overfunded pension obligations. Overfund in what sense? You have more assets than you owe. It's a little tricky because you might not be able to claim that overfunding, but you're basically mopping up. So when you mop it, just make sure you don't double count assets, 
but it's okay to count assets you haven't counted yet in the cash flows. Last step in the process, you're trying to decide what to subtract out, what debt to subtract out to get to equity. Subtract out all the interest-bearing debt and lease commitments you treated as debt to come up with cost of capital, so that's the easy one. But this is also your last chance to mop up for anything else that might trouble you. So if you have a tobacco company as your investment, what might, you, what might worry you? You might be the target of lawsuits, and you might worry about what if I lose those lawsuits? You have to take the expected value of those lawsuit losses and subtract them from the value of your equity. Not easy to do, but I don't see a way around it. So this is your last chance to deal with anything else that might concern you. Use the chance. So in summary, after you've discounted the cash flows back at the cost of capital to get to the value of the operating assets, mop up, add the cash and marketable securities, value the cross holdings the best you can, and if you have a company that has minority holdings or majority holdings, see if you can value them correctly. If, you, if not, use one of the approximations I suggested. Add any other assets you haven't counted yet. Don't double count. And subtract out debt, and in this case, define debt expansively, not narrowly as we did with the cost of capital. And you should have the value of equity in your business.